One of the things that I'd say about Australians is that they've got the world's best bull dust detectors. They recognise authenticity, uh, authenticity very quickly. And if you're not authentic, they won't listen. So I think in part they were responding, if I can pay you a compliment, by the fact that you weren't talking about you. You were talking about us. You were addressing where we are all together as human beings. And in a way, it was as though you were saying, to get to the good news, you've actually got to go through what might be called the valley of death. You've got to face yourself. You've got to be realistic about yourself and the world that you live in. And I saw those young people, it was almost as though they were saying, we're sick to death of the therapy culture that offers us sort of... It's a relief to everyone. There's a, there's a dictum uh, that Carl Jung derived from the great alchemist. That's so in circulinus invenitur, and it means what you most want will be found where you least want to look. What yeah. you most yeah. need yeah. will be found where you least want to look. And that yeah. people yeah. know that. Yeah. You know, everyone yeah. knows that they are tired of naive optimism, let's say, and not optimism, because optimism doesn't have to be naive. And they know perfectly well that the way to set themselves right is to take careful stock of themselves and to pay very careful attention to the errors that they know they're making and to and to grow up and to mature and to and to adopt the responsibilities of a forthright citizen and i think people are sick to death of too much discussion of rights and and too much discussion of self esteem and all that all that all that discussion that goes along with what everyone owes you it's like it's just not helpful to people because it isn't your rights that give you meaning in life and you need a meaning to set against the tragedy. And everyone knows that the way that you find that meaning is by adopting responsibility. Obviously, for yourself, you got to take care of yourself, your family. I mean, you want to be a good person to your parents. You want to be a good person to your siblings and your children, clearly. And you have to bear some responsibility for your community. And if you're really firing on all cylinders, you do all those things at the same time, you know, and, and I do believe, and I tell people, I do believe that the world is a tragic and malevolent place in many, many ways, but that the way forward through that is, is to do everything you can to put yourself on the side of what's good and to aim high, and that that's where you get the dignity that enables you to, to bear life without becoming corrupt. And everyone knows this is true. Who's gonna argue with that? Having found yourself, and having, if you like, being realistic about yourself and recognising, we were talking about this last time, the dividing line between good and evil is not between black and white or whatever, uh, captor and jailer uh, uh, um, uh, or man and woman, it's somewhere across every human heart. Having recognised that, you can then go on and help build a stronger, fairer, more just, more humane society, rather than what seems to be the way people approach it at the moment and say, uh, uh, that somehow or other your society can fix your problems. Yes, well, that's it. And I mean, for young people in particular, it's, it's actually a very depressing message for young people to hear that it's time for them to get involved in political activism. Because any young person who has any sense knows perfectly well, if they're, especially if they're 18 or so, 19 years old, is they don't know a damn thing. You know, they, they haven't started a business. They haven't started a family. They don't have a permanent relationship. They're not educated. They don't have any experience. And for someone to come and say, well, you're in a position to change the world is nothing but a way of, of disenchanting them with adult wisdom. It's like, you're not ready to change the world. You've got a lot to learn, but you can learn it. And in learning it, you'll become much more powerful and much more charismatic and much more articulate and much more wise and sensible. And that's the way forward to, to being much more than you are. And Young people, of course, when you're 18 and you have 60 years of life ahead of you, what you want to hear above all else is that there's way more of you yet to come. Because yeah. you, what else are you going to do with those 60 years? So it's, it's, it's a message. It's a harsh message because it says, well, you're not everything you could be. But it's a deeply optimistic message because, it's, because the idea is that you could be way more than you are, incomparably more than you are. And I do believe that. And what's so fun about this is that people keep telling me that, keep, people keep telling me that it's true. You know, I have people, endless people. I got one kid come up to me the other day. It was so fun. He said, a year and a half ago, I had just got out of jail and I was homeless. And he said, I've started listening to your lectures. And I just, 
I got married this year, I have a child and I just bought my apartment. It's like, wow, man, good work. You know, and you did that in a year and a half. And you know, I, I was in LA the other, about a month ago and, and you know, this, I, I was in a rough part of LA, uh, downtown LA near the Apollo Theater and I'd given a talk there. My wife and I were walking down the street and this car pick pulled up and this kid hopped out and he was about 19 or so, good looking Hispanic kid ran over and asked me if I was Dr. Peterson. I said, yes, and he was all excited. He said he'd been watching my videos for about a year and a half and that they'd really helped him straighten out his life. He was just smiling away. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he ran back to his car and he came back out with his dad. And his dad was standing there, you know, and they had their arms around each other and they were just grinning like mad. And the kid said, look, I've really put my relationship together with my father and we're really on board with this together and they were just like so happy you couldn't believe it and that just happens over and over like it happens i would say four or five times a day in restaurants or in airports or well you've been experiencing that to some degree in australia you said and it's it's so good and the mainstream media that's been covering what i've been doing you know they just miss this completely because everything it seems like everything that constitutes news in our society has to be political and group oriented and this isn't political and it's not group oriented. What I'm trying to do as a good clinical psychologist and perhaps a good educator, and I mean good, striving to be good in the moral sense, is to help people develop as individuals. And they are, and it's really working. And it's, it's a thrill to be on this tour because that's all I hear. And no one talks to me about the political issues or very, very rarely. And it, it's all, because I also think that the battle against collectivism, let's say, the battle against identity politics isn't to be had in the political realm. Uh, maybe that's a secondary issue. What The way that you, that you fight for the sovereignty of the individual is by getting your act together and, and right locally, right where you are, and, and starting to take advantage of everything that you have in front of you. And, and, and you do no harm that way. All you do is make yourself less bad. Who, what's the harm in that? That's a good thing. To some extent, I think the battle here is almost one of statism or collectivism versus individual liberty. Who's going to shape who? So you've got the whole the sort of push from the left, identity politics, victimhood policies, uh, approaches and what have you. We owe these people what have you. So the state has control and shapes individuals and helps them forward. On the other hand, you have the different view that says, no, the state should be shaped by the people who make up the state. You know, Australia is a sum total of individuals who are Australian, and they ought to be shaping the public square, not having the public square, if you like, or the public sector, shaping them. You know, the whole argument is about what, what, what's the primary unit of analysis. That's everything. What's the primary unit of analysis? And in the West, the primary unit of the analysis has been the logos. And that's something like divine individual consciousness. And it's on that ground that we developed our idea of individual sovereignty and citizenship. And, you know, we don't talk about a citizen is someone who adopts the responsibilities of an ethical being. That's a citizen. We don't talk about that even in schools and tell people that, look, the meaning in your life is going to be found it's going to be proportionate to the degree that you take responsibility for positively shaping your experience and the experience of the people around you. And this isn't like be good in some, in some weak, be inoffensive and harmless sense. It's not that at all. It's like get your spine straight, get your aggression integrated, pick a heavy goal, like a heavy high goal, something you can barely tolerate lifting and struggle along with it. And that's where you'll find your self-respect. And, and people know that it's, it's fun to watch the working class guys respond to this too, you know, because they know this, most of those guys work like mad, you know, and they know that there's nobility in that. And, and, and there is. And so it's, it's, well, and people also say, well, that, that they're happy to come to my lectures or even read the book because I'm helping them find words to express things that they already knew to be true. And those things that they know to be true are the, bedrock axioms of our culture. And one of the things we got right in the West was the idea of the sovereign, responsible individual, not the person with rights, and certainly not the person with rights granted to them by the state. That's not part of the English common law tradition. You're the locus of rights, but, 
but only in some sense because you're the locus of ultimate responsibility. And I guess part of what I've been trying to tell people is that there's no difference between meaning and responsibility. They're the same thing. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.